It may seem a little ungrateful to start a literary festival with the title Beyond Words and to talk about things. But I want to explain why, um, that, uh, why I've chosen to do that. And I want to start, if I may, in a temple to words and to literature, the reading room in the British Museum. It is a place, it is the temple of the book, it is a temple of the word. It's in this room that worlds of the imagination were conjured and given life. It's in this room that Dickens and Virginia Woolf wrote, for example. But it's also in this room that the real world was described and analyzed. Here, Darwin and Marx also wrote. And what I want to look at is really the connection between the reading room and the museum around it, between the words, the ideas, and then the things that supplement them and develop them. Marx's famous phrase that the duty of philosophers was not to explain the world but to change it is at the heart of what I want to talk about. The books change the world, the things show us how they change, and they often tell us different stories. And I do want to start uh, with, with Marx, the most famous reader in that reading room. This is his application for a reading ticket. Um, all the reading ticket applications are so here he is, Karl Marx, with his address and the promise that he's more than 21 years old. And it's in that room that he wrote Das Kapital, probably the most influential book along with The Origin of Species of the whole 19th century. And if we want to look at one of the ways in which we can see the impact of that book, then we can go upstairs in the British Union to look at a plate celebrating the triumph of his work and the overthrowing of Capital. It's one of those beautiful Russian porcelain plates made by the great revolutionary artists to celebrate the triumph of the worker. And here you see the man of the future the red proletariat laborer trampling on capital. And as capital is trampled and shattered, the real energy of the worker in the factories is released. The new dynamism of the post-capital world and the new dawn is about to break. It's the most wonderful image of what appeared to be the realization of Marx's writings. What is interesting about it is that if you turn over the plate, then you can see that the porcelain is, in fact, not just porcelain of the Russian Revolution with the hammer and the sickle, but actually it was a plate made in 1913 with the imperial uh, monogram of Nicholas with the crown. This is Russian imperial porcelain of 1913, reused by the Soviets of 1923. And you might just say, well, that's what happens. Stocks of old dinner plates have to be used up somehow. And that's what the Soviets did. But in fact, it's much more interesting than that. Because dinner plates are always extraordinarily interesting. They're the moment you tell all your important guests what you think is important. That's why the Russian uh, imperial family had the uh, the, the imperial factory, and it's why the Soviets went on using porcelain. But they went on using this porcelain very particularly because this plate, as you may imagine, was not really meant to be used as a dinner plate. This plate, made in 1923, was made because the new Soviet state was in a very serious foreign exchange crisis, and it needed to sell objects to the capitalist West. One of the things the capitalist West wanted were Im uh, images like this, uh, go back one, uh, images like uh, uh, this one, uh, as collector's items of the aesthetics of the revolution. And the Soviets discovered that people in the West were prepared to pay far more if they also had the Tsar's monogram on the back. 
It is, if you like, both the triumph and the reversal of the Marxian dream. And it's why things are so important, because they tell us the things that the historians often don't want to tell us. They tell us what the writers conceal or what the writers wish were otherwise. And if we want to pursue that dream uh, and the collapse of that dream and the reversal of that dream, we can move to another porcelain plate in the British Museum made in the year 2000, made directly on the model of the one before. And this celebrates, you can see the date at the bottom, 2000, and it celebrates the investment fund for the electro-technical world, uh, um, electro-energetic worlds of Russia. This is a plate to celebrate, celebrate the privatization of the, those very industries which you saw being taken over by the workers in the plate 80 years earlier. And again, for the same reason, they want to celebrate using an aesthetic of the past to show that this is even more extraordinary what they have achieved. And of course, the investment that came for the privatization came from that very Western world on which the Soviet regime had so reluctantly depended. The th two plates make the point that is central to Marx's arguments about commerce and the economics of the world. There is only one world. It's all interconnected and it's all about exchange. And if we want to understand who we are, we need to understand that we, the we, is the whole world. The we can never be alone. It's what the British Museum was founded largely to demonstrate. It's what the objects tell us. This is a particularly good 20th century political example. But if we go much further back, all the objects in the museum from the very beginning tell us the same. We all came out of Africa, as you know. We, somewhere around half a million years ago, perhaps a bit more, came out of Africa because of one simple technology, the hand axe, the most important technology in human history. For 99% of our history, this is what allowed humans to manage the world around them. It lets you strip branches off the trees to uh, use the, the branches for fuel or for building. It lets you strip uh, hides off animals, it lets you break bones to get marrow, it lets you butcher the animals. It is what allowed your, every, uh, uh, humans to leave Africa for Europe, for Asia, for Australia, everywhere. This technology is all around the world. This comes from Indonesia, but you can see a very similar one, chipped away to hold in the hand, hand just like yours. This is about 400,000 years old. Similar one in Jordan, uh, uh, about the same age, uh, beautifully shaped and faceted. And a similar one, um, crude and clumsy, this one naturally comes from England, um, was found somewhere near Heathrow, um, and shows that even then uh, Heathrow was somehow connected to the rest of the world. It's the same technology. This is what we all used to live for most of human history. They also tell us something else. This allowed us to shape the world, but we wanted to shape the things. It's a simple object with two blades, as you can see, to handle, but we wanted it to be more. From the very beginning, we want to make these things beautiful. These wonderful shapes. This is about half a million years old. No point in making a tool so beautiful other than to make it beautiful. And we can demonstrate that from the very beginning of human history, we all love beautiful, flashy, expensive things. This is the I think the oldest documented evidence uh, for bling in human history. It's a perfectly ordinary hand axe found in Olduvai in Tanzania, in the Rift Valley, where all these objects were first found, where humans begin. It's about uh, 800,000 years old. We know that from the strata of the, of, 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 of the volcanic uh, uh, ash. And it's a beautiful pink quartz stone that's very hard to carve, but it sparkles and glistens, and it's a very pleasing color. It doesn't come from that spot at all. It comes from a very long way away. It must have been brought, used, worked, only because it looks pretty. This is the beginning of the world's jewelry industry. And this one, and just to show you, found in the same place, show you the different size. This one, beautifully 
shaped, magnificently modelled, is far too big to use at all. About half a million years ago, we're making things that are completely useless, but very beautiful. Why? It must be for a reason. These people were people like us. Is it for power? Is it to show power? Is it for ritual purposes? We don't know. But what it does show is that all of us, from the beginning, have the desire to make beautiful things, the desire to have things from far away, and an understanding of something beyond use, about power, belief, or whatever. And that is, of course, what writers like Marx have always were, were interested in. And particularly that idea of the exchange, that it's exchange, trade, and that desire for things from far away that bring us together. That is the dynamic of human history. And as we began with a dinner plate, we can move on with another dinner plate, which makes a very comparable point, exactly that point, that we love what's from far away, we love new things, and we love things that are beyond what is necessary for use. Another dinner plate, but a dinner plate made for Admiral Anson. Anson, the British Admiral, in the 1730s, sails around the world. It's a very significant uh, circumnavigation. He does a lot of discovering uh, and charting. He does a lot of mapping and charting. Uh, he finds, uh, and he does, of course, quite a bit of trading or robbing, depending on how you like it. Um, uh, mostly, of course, from the Spanish, who are still around with ships with lots of silver on them. And when he gets home, he decides that what he wants to do with his money is to record that sail around the world in his dinner plates. Only one place to get porcelain at that stage, 1737, 1738, the main center is still China. It's the great Chinese material. It's the technology that Europe is beginning to try to imitate in Meissen, but the best porcelain, the only real porcelain is still China. So I, Anson orders his dinner plates from London in China. And he shows in the middle breadfruit tree from an island in Indonesia that he'd visited and where he'd drawn the botanical specimen of the breadfruit, which was, he thought, a very interesting crop. And on this side, he shows Canton, the Pearl River in China and Canton. And on this side, he shows Plymouth, which was his home port. So every day in the 1740s, he could dine between China and England and show that he'd been in the Pacific. It is the perfect demonstration of a globalized world, a globalized economy in the sense that we understand it. People trading right round the world, the whole world, and putting it together for all kinds of purposes. And to buy it, he paid in the only global currency of the time, the currency that he'd probably stolen quite a lot of, Spanish pieces of eight. The first global currency, mined by the Spaniards in Bolivia, in Potosí, taken up to Panama, and then huge fleets of silver sent from Panama to Europe and to Manila, and so to Asia. The world currency is Spanish silver. And it's so much the world currency that people don't bother making their own coins, they just adapt the Chinese, the, 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 the Spanish coins. So when the Chinese take it over, they keep using them, but they make little chop marks to show they've gone right through to check that it's silver all the way through. Even then, the Chinese are rather suspicious about the quality of foreign goods, and they're so sort of chop marks testing that this Spanish silver is real silver. And when the British need currency for their new colony in Australia, they characteristically are too mean to make their own. So they use Spanish pieces of eight, but they take out the middle. Uh, so you still have uh, Carolus of Spain, just Charles of Spain uh, rule here, but you may just be able to see stamped here five shillings. Um, uh, an extraordinary demonstration of the fact that this world functions as one world 300 years ago in the sense that we understand. All this 
demonstrates what the philosophers, the historians, the economists tell us. It demonstrates it in ways unexpected and in ways which national historians might not want us to know. But there's a big problem, as you know, about history and about texts. Texts require to be able to write. Most of humanity, for most of history, has not been able to write. How is their history to be told? History is written, as we know, by the victors. What about those who are the losers in the great global contacts and contests? That's where I think the things become so important because they can tell us the stories that would otherwise not survive. And I want to look essentially at one object that makes that point, I think, better than any other. It is a drum, which you can see it's about that high. And it was acquired right at the beginning uh, of the life of the British Museum by the first collector, Hans Sloan, in 1737. So the same date as Anson, as Anson is commissioning his plate in China, Sloan, a doctor in London, has decided he wants to look at how people across the world do the same thing in different ways. And he knows that everybody, all human beings, have music. Um, all human beings need dance, they need song, and they need musical instruments. And so he asks ship captains, like Anson, to bring him home to London, instruments from all around the world. And this one comes from Virginia, is bought in Virginia in the 1730s, and he adds it to his collection with a little note saying, Native American drum. He then calls it Indian, I'm sorry, I have to tell you, India, American Indian drum. And that enters the British Museum and is on show there from 1760. Now, the pace of scholarship in museums uh, mostly is a fairly leisurely one. And it remained on show in the museum with the label Native Indian American Drum from 1760 until 1890, before it occurred to anybody that it didn't really look very like a Native American Indian drum. And at that stage, a curator took it off the shelf, looked at it more closely, particularly at the carving on the side, and particularly at the cords that held it together, and thought that it really looked much more like an African drum. It was sent off to Kew, to the Botanical Gardens, and it was discovered that the wood is indeed from the cordia tree that grows only in West Africa, that the cords that hold it come from trees that grow only in West Africa, somewhere between Nigeria and Ghana, and it became very clear that what we were looking at was not, in fact, an Indian-American drum used by Native Americans, but an African drum, part of a king's orchestra from West Africa. This is uh, an image of the 1890s showing uh, the drum very much um, uh, as it would have been used. You can see, I think, that this drum is very like uh, the, 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 the one I showed you. Um, and that we're looking at a royal orchestra of West Africa. And then the question comes, because we know this was bought in Virginia in the 1730s, how did a royal African drum from, West Afri from uh, Ghana, Nigeria, reach Virginia? And of course, there is only one answer, and that is the slave trade. The only possible explanation is that it's part of that great hideous trade in people uh, where industrial goods came mostly from Britain and France to West Africa. They were then exchanged for slaves who were taken to the Caribbean and uh, North America. And then sugar and cotton was taken back to Europe, the triangular trade. It was, as you all know, one of the most brutal trades in history. The slaves were taken uh, by African rulers, captured by African rulers, 
sold to the Europeans for manufactured goods and then at the ports of the Gold Coast put onto slave ships. This is the most famous slave ship because it's the one that became the symbol of the move to abolish the slave trade. It's called the Brooks, and you can see, I hope even at this distance, that every one of these figures is a body, a slave, chained, and on the decks. And you can see the number of decks, and at the bottom there is the whole ship is full, this one. You can see the conditions, and you can understand why uh, the slave trade led on the passage across the Atlantic to so many deaths. It's important to remember, because the later history tried to forget, just how much and enthusiastically many people wanted to support this trade. So as well as this print, which became, for years, this was the only image that Quaker families were allowed to have in their house. Um, it was the great emblem of abolition. But at the same time as this, against the slave trade, people were producing jugs for the Brooks, the ship, precisely the same ship, so that you could celebrate the uh, success of the ship and to the Brooks and wish success to its captain. The slave trade, we can see from these objects, was supported right across the population as well as opposed by a few. And it was on the Brooks, ships like the Brooks, that this drum was taken. It tells us something, I think, very, very important. First of all, it tells us the unwelcome fact that the African rulers were part of this trade as well as the British uh, and the French traders. And we know they sent their sons often on the ships to see how the trade worked at the other end. We also know that the conditions were so bad that one of the one, many slaves jumped overboard. And in order to fight depression, in order to keep them in some measure healthy, they were encouraged to dance on the ship. And the drum was almost certainly taken by one of the ruler's sons in order that the slaves would dance on the ship for their health uh, above all. When they got to the plantation, Drums were also used for dancing. We have, of course, only the images made by the plantation owners. But here you see the slaves dancing to uh, drum music, uh, drum and banjo music here uh, on the plantation. They were used not only for music. They were also, we know, used for a great many slave revolts. When the slaves, as they frequently did, tried to free themselves. They captured the drums, called the other slaves together by the drums, and then led a rebellion. And in the 1730s, drums were forbidden by the state of Virginia and confiscated. And we can only imagine that that is the moment at which this drum became available for sale. It is an extraordinary instrument. It lets us, I think, cross the Atlantic with those slaves. There's obviously virtually no literature on this, uh, only one very s complex uh, memoir. It lets you imagine what it was like to be on both sides of the slave trade, the ruler with the orchestra first, the slaves on the ship and on the plantation. And it is, of course, this tradition of music that ultimately turns into the great African-American traditions of jazz. And because we know when it was acquired and from whom, it's, the fact is that this drum is the oldest documented African-American musical instrument. It stands at the head of the whole tradition of jazz, the whole tradition of African-American music, which has taken the world uh, since then. Is what only things can do. And I think, put together with the texts, they allow us a deeper imaginative engagement with the global stories 
uh, of the owners of the brooks, of the shareholders in the brooks, of the supporters of the brooks, and of the slaves who were being sold. I think these kinds of stories are ever more important because the implications of a truly global world and the consequences it has are so concerning for us all, as well as so positive. We all know the positive sides. But another African object, this time from East Africa in the museum, um, which was recently at the CSMVS, uh, makes the point just as strongly. It is, as you see, an armchair, a throne, made out of pieces of rifles, called a throne of weapons. It sits in an African tradition that after a war, the defeated, the arms of the defeated were taken and turned into a throne on which the victor could sit, usually spears, shields, that sort of thing. These weapons were all used in the terrible civil war in Mozambique, which followed independence uh, from Portugal in the 1970s. It was a civil war, as you know, fought out as a proxy war between the capitalist West and the uh, communist East, and it led to millions of dead. When the war ended, the question was what to do with all the weapons that were still circulating in this imperfectly pacified country. And a very brilliant bishop, Singolani, decided he would run a scheme called Swords into Plowshares. If you handed in your weapons, you would be given in return for your weapons uh, a sewing machine, a bicycle, something of that sort that would help the economy to recover. But he also thought they must be shown and shown to be decommissioned. This, as you know, is an extraordinarily difficult problem in Northern Ireland, it was for 30, 40 years an extraordinarily difficult and contentious issue, how to show the weapons that had been taken out of use. Singolani decided to make them into objects that could be displayed and making a throne of weapons, not for the victor in the conflict, because there is no victor in a civil war, but for peace. And the British Museum acquired this as its way to document the contemporary history of Africa since independence in Mozambique as a key document of that. It's a document that is extraordinarily revealing if you do the usual museum things of just asking where do the different bits come from, what is this actually made of? Because if we analyze the object you can see that uh, the back struts, if you like, both those rifle butts, they're Portuguese, Portuguese rifles, the old colonial power, weapons from the, uh, from, from the days of colonial occupation, used uh, as, as, over there. The weapons round about um, uh, are, tell, a very, tell, a very, tell the later, story of Africa. This came from one of the areas in Mozambique which was largely controlled um, by the communist, so to speak, party. Um, and so the arms and the back, uh, the, uh, here, the arms of the chair and the back of it are made from parts of Soviet AK-47s. The front bar is made from a rifle made in Czechoslovakia. The right-hand strut of the seat was made, is a rifle made in Poland. The base struts are all uh, AK-47s, uh, except this leg, which was made in North Korea. If a throne like this had been made from another part of Mozambique, all the weapons would have come from Britain, France, the US, and Germany. What it tells us is, of course, that you can't have a war in Africa without the rest of the world providing the weapons. An African war is a war made possible by the international community. And that is a document that is stronger, I think, 
than anything likely to be written. The power of this object as an emblem of reconciliation meant that when it came to the British Museum, we were asked to send it to Northern Ireland, where it went, and to Coventry Cathedral for a service of reconciliation to mark the anniversaries, one of the anniversaries of the end of the Second World War. And after it had been shown in Coventry Cathedral, the colleagues in Mozambique asked for it to go back to Mozambique, having taken on these other resonances of work in reconciliation done in Ireland and in Europe. It is, I think, the sort of thing that only objects can do as their lives run on beyond the individual lives of the people involved. That's, I think, what things can tell us about what it means to be part of a world community, unexpected ways, uncomfortable ways, and ways which are often not the way our politicians or our political writers want us to think. And I want to finish by another person in the reading room who talked not so much about exchange and trade, but about power and how power is exercised. In the same room, same register, but later on, Dr. Jakob Richter. You, few of you will, I imagine, have heard of Dr. Jakob Richter, which is not surprising because it's a false name. It was the name used by Lenin when he came to read here. And he, of course, was reading about power and pamphlets. How do you promote power? How does the ruler establish power? And how does he then maintain it? It was to be a rather significant question for Lenin, as we all know, um, in 1917. And here are the things, again, give us, I think, a much more interesting and complex conspectus than any particular set of writings. Um, power inevitably begins with a person. This is, as you will, many of you recognize, the personal uh, uh, armor of the Emperor Akbar. It's a rather low resolution slide of a very beautiful object, and it's deliberately low resolution because I want you all to go and look at it in the CSMVS, where you can see it. And you will notice the astonishing quality of the metalwork. It's made precisely to fit the man. Power, in this sense, is always about a particular man, one man. Akbar has it made for him, takes great care over it, beautifully uh, ornamented as well, just like that hand axe, ornamented far beyond need to show power, to show authority. Um, here on the bit to protect the neck, uh, verses um, from the uh, Quran, uh, uh, and here on the breastplate, a statement saying that uh, this uh, is the personal garment of the emperor of lofty fortune, Akbar. The wonderful phrase, the emperor of lofty fortune. Uh, and the year is uh, 989 of the Hijra, which is 1581 uh, for the rest of the world. Um, an extraordinary demonstration of leadership power. You need power, you need a man, and you need that kind of concern uh, for the military side. And you then need administration. The little drawing by Rembrandt uh, of Jahangir, um, which was at the CSMVS last year, the India and the World Exhibition, supported by the Tata Trusts. One of the things that the Europeans were mesmerized by in the middle of the 1640s was Indian administration. Europe in the middle of the Thirty Years' War, Britain in the middle of the Civil War, chaos everywhere in Europe, great admiration for the administrative skills of the emperor, and this is all this is being demonstrated, an emperor administering. Power, you show the emperor, Emperor Hadrian uh, particularly. The Roman emperor, they like to show the face of the emperor. That is what the authority is. And you demonstrate your authority by putting the emperor physically right round the empire. This one was in London. And then at some point there must have been a revolt in London rather it's a preliminary Brexit moment, um, when uh, the Roman power was thrown into the Thames, probably uh, assaulted first. This is probably deliberate damage, and then thrown into the Thames. The presence of the emperor in person 
is always a very dangerous thing. Much wiser to talk about ideas. And for me, one of the most interesting things in the Exhibition India in the World in the CSMVS last year was the conjunction of three great inscriptions from India, China, and Rome, showing how power is presented and what methods are used by the ruler to project his authority. Ashoka, you all know better than I, deciding to project an ethical view of the world, promoting in his edicts the responsibilities of the emperor to the citizens, the citizens' uh, responsibilities to each other, a code of behavior for the citizen and for the ruler, carved in different languages in different places across the empire. I think something never tried elsewhere and which enabled an enormous empire to be constructed. Completely different in China is 10th century rubbing. The Chinese typically a huge inscription on stone, always in the same language, always in the one language, the only language of the empire, often on rocks, sometimes on stones, pointing out the emperor's divine duties and the oneness of the huge empire. That it's one empire with one script, one emperor under a divine order. And because the stones are difficult to move around, what you're looking at is actually a paper rubbing. Uh, hundreds of these were made from the 10th century so that you can replicate the inscription, you can replicate the rock inscription all around the empire. So the whole empire has the same language, the same message, and it's about the divine order. The Romans, much more pragmatic. This is from Roman Egypt. A very simple inscription beside a bridge telling you that it's thanks to the Roman Empire that you've got this bridge. And it's thanks to the emperor in particular. And it says that the, the, this bridge was put up by the emperor. But you may notice that the name of the emperor has actually been rubbed out. And this is, of course, the problem of empires that insist on telling you what particular people did. The emperor, um, it was almost certainly Trajan, uh, we know it was Trajan, um, the, a later rebe rebellion, later revolt, simply took out his name. The bridge remains, the inscription remains, the name has gone. You might think, already be thinking of the Victoria Terminus, uh, uh, or the museum that now has the longest name in the world. Um, <laughs> The monuments remain, the ruler, the name of the ruler has gone. The fleetingness of empires, but also how empires try to present themselves. Universal truths that things from a particular place allow us to grasp. But I don't want to end on power from the top, because this shows that power from the top is always ultimately ultimately, somehow, controlled, removed, managed by power from below. And this is where things are our only source. The worker on that Marxian plate, the proletarian trampling capital underfoot, he didn't write anything. We don't know what he said or thought. How do we know what the people are thinking? One of the things we have and it's a very interesting thing to start collecting, are button badges. Button badges are the most wonderful demonstration of small groups of people organizing things often against power. So here you have people protesting against nuclear power um, and coal power in Pennsylvania. Um, here you have black women's movement for political action. Uh, this, of course, is uh, against Nixon, um, impeachment. Yeah. Um, this is, again, uh, urging uh, action against uh, racism in the United States. And the usual jokey one about Ronald Reagan and no bonzos. What's interesting about this is that these, of course, are done against power without control. They're ephemeral. 
that they speak to something that really matters to people. And they show that the great weapon of the people is always humor. And the astonishing fact that just as we want to make things beautiful, just as we want to make them too big to be used, there's something magic about both of those, we always are able, all around the world, all humans, somehow, to find humor in what we're doing, even in the most serious things like this. Button badges, some of them are magnificently silly. Um, this, I think, is the, <laughs> without doubt, the silliest uh, object in the whole of the British Museum. And when we were wondering how to collect evidence to show how the world responded to the second Iraq war, the second Gulf War, the invasion of Iraq in 2003, that catastrophic event, um, one of the ways we found of demonstrating it was this badge. I hope you can read it. Uh, <laughs> but, um, um, but, um, but, but, but. These are the things, this is what things can tell us, that people thought this. Whatever was ultimately decided, the great political histories will talk about what the leaders decided to do and its consequences. What people were actually thinking, the things can tell us. And I want to go back to the simple person, that person that we saw, the proletarian worker, Akbar, the individual person, the individual an individual that can tell us something about the global world in which we all live today. Akbar had his breastplate made specially for him. And I want to finish with what is another kind of breastplate, a football shirt. It's the football shirt of Drogba, uh, one of the great football stars uh, of the last 10, 15 years. Drogba was born uh, in the Côte d'Ivoire, so, black African, French speaking, with extraordinary gift for football, went from the Côte d'Ivoire to Paris, where he played for Paris Saint-Germain, and then moved from Paris Saint-Germain to Chelsea, and this is a Chelsea shirt. So, a Côte d'Ivoirien playing for an English club, which is, of course, owned by Roman Abramovich, a Russian billionaire. So we have a very personal global narrative there already. He's now moved to Canada. But this shirt is even more interesting. This is a Chelsea shirt, but it's not an official Chelsea shirt. This is a rip-off Chelsea shirt made in China. <laughs> and it seemed to us important, if we were trying to document this kind of thing at the museum, we didn't buy it either in China or in Chelsea. This was bought in Buenos Aires. <laughs> Boys in Buenos Aires want to wear the shirt of a footballer from Côte d'Ivoire who's played in Paris and London and a shirt made in China. It is the demonstration, the happiest demonstration, that we are living in one world, for good or for ill, as we always have been. And that, I think, is a story that things can perhaps tell us better than anything else. Thank you very much. Thank you.